Welcome to the Law Society Younger Members Committee Career Information Session number three, when Meg Delargy speaks to Donna McGrath about finding, moving into and succeeding in an in-house role. And welcome you to the third in the series of the Law Society Younger Members Committee and the Younger S and Law Society Career Support Ser Services Spring Series Career Information Session. My name is Maeve Delargy and I am a member of the Younger Members Committee and I'm delighted to be joined today by Donna McGrath who's going to speak to us on the topic of finding, moving into and succeeding in an in-house role. Donna is the UK and Ireland's lead coach mentor and strategist for in-house lawyers. She left practice last year to set up the ILLP, the In-House Lawyers Leadership Programme, in recognition of the need for in-house lawyers to have a safe space to talk to someone who understands exactly their stresses and has the tools to move them forward. The whole purpose is to raise the impact of the individual and the legal function. So Donna, uh, it's over to you now. And uh, we'll start off, there's, there's a good number of people in Ireland who are practicing in-house, yeah. but I am in private practice, as I'm sure a lot of the people listening today are. So what do we need to consider before making the move in-house? Okay, so there are a number of things that we need to consider before making any um, change within our career, whether it be moving from private practice into in-house or moving from a different firm to another firm or moving within different organizations and there's one two key things that a lot of people don't do which could potentially um land them in a position within a new role which it isn't necessarily the right role for them so uh, people who come towards me in my program and um, they um, say I want to make a move and the first question I always ask and I would say to you the first thing to consider is what is it about the role that you are in right now that you are not happy with what are those things write them down is it a people issue is it a process issue is it a firm issue or is it maybe something that you're not coping with now the reason why i think that is so key is because i find that until you ask that question you don't really know what the underlying cause of why you're unhappy now i've had two people in my program and they have said they want to move in house to private practice lawyers once we got to the bottom of what was actually going on for them it turned out that their coping mechanisms had just fallen away and they were just they were suffering from burnout they were just really tired and frustrated so we had to get past that and get to the core and when we got to the core it was really clear that their coping mechanisms just were failing them so we worked on them and they ended up staying in the role. So one now has actually been promoted within the role. And if they had a move, they would have been moving for the wrong reason. And they would have been taking that problem from where they were into the new role, which isn't going to be successful for anybody. And it's going to affect your confidence. So that's the first key consideration. The next one is really consider the things about your role and your current role that you actually really enjoy because we do sometimes move or get a jolt to move because of something negative that's happened and whenever you then make the move you're moving you want to move so far away from where you were that you end up uh, forgetting about the things that you really enjoyed and then land in a role that doesn't have those things anymore so you're moving from a to B and the issues haven't been resolved and not alone that you aren't even um, enjoying the parts of the job that you did jo enjoy before so I think that is so key now the third thing is very sector specific and th this is about you as a lawyer and how you identify yourself as a lawyer now we know that in our profession that there is a real strong sense of 
getting to the nitty gritty of things and getting into the deep issues within a case, case law um, in order to interpret that and give the right advice. And there's some brilliant lawyers that I know who've been in private practice and they are actually real experts within their area. Now, if you are a private practice lawyer and you really identify with that, I would ask you to question whether a move in house would be right for you. Now, the reason why I say that is because when you move in house, your expert knowledge does get diluted simply because most in house teams, I say most in house teams, will require you to turn your hand to different things. And you basically where you become that council, that general council, if you like. Um, so you need to be able to pick up um, maybe a little bit of corporate law or a little bit of employment or a little bit of data protection or anti-bribery or whatever that is. And to have a good understanding of, of, of those at a basic level is really important to be an in-house lawyer. So I say most in-house jobs are like that. Um, but there are some in-house structures that do allow for you to retain that level of expertise. So if you are still an expert and you want to be an expert and you want to move in-house, those expert roles are probably a little bit fewer, but you can always hold out for it. But just be mindful if you did go before that and move, that you're likely to move away from that expert status. I was just actually saying to Keith that here in um, England and Wales, because I'm in England and Wales, even though I've got a Northern accent, um, that over here, uh, lawyers are super nation. So not alone are they a competition lawyer or an IP lawyer, they're an IP lawyer for a high tech company mm. or a retail company. So they are super nation. So there are super niches here and it is, you do have the ability to take that niche and move into an in-house role but again they are few and far between so there would there would be the top three considerations i could i could speak all day on that yeah. but i think um if you are really thinking about it um go through that exercise and if you do want a little bit more support obviously reach out to me on linkedin i've put my link in the chat Great. Yeah, yeah. Super niching. Maybe the only superpower that a lawyer will have, you know, could be <laughs> the way to go. It doesn't make work all night. Um, you know, as a place to start, you know, that, that that really makes sense. And not to run into a new job, like running away from something, you know, really assess and, and make sure to hang on to the stuff you like. Yeah, that is what I do say to my clients. It's like, what are you running away from? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it'll, it'll come with you, as you say, if you don't address it. Exactly. So, um so if then you get to the to that stage and you're talking there about some um in-house roles and things so you know what are the the top three differences between in-house and private practice okay so first of all i would like to uh, do a myth buster for everybody that is a private pr practice lawyer and think that in-house lawyers get it easy um that's not accurate really. I would actually say that I worked more hours as an in-house lawyer and then I did in private practice mm. and it's probably because of my skill set I was probably more suited towards an in-house role uh, but the main differences some of them these are so obvious but the impact of it um, makes a very different environment. So the first one as we all know how private practice lawyers get um, assessed in terms of their performance is very, very different, um, which actually dictates the behaviours within the teams and, and within the firms and within the in-house legal team. So as we know, private practice lawyers contribute towards the bottom line. They get measured on billable hours and uh, the ability to bring in new clients. In-house, it's not like that because they don't have that direct effect on the bottom line so they tend to get measured more on the how they deliver the legal service and how efficient they are how well they engage with the in-house client and um, how um, opportunistic are they in terms of looking at opportunities to enhance the legal function so that's all more about the, the how 
And the sense and the feeling of working in those two environments are quite different. When you work in an environment and you have real clarity on the number that you need to hit, uh, that's a little bit more satisfying. When you're in house, there's a little bit more confusion around your goals and your targets and your strategies. And you're not overly clear whether you're making an impact. So you have to do extra stuff. And that is the first big difference. The second big difference, which kind of leads on from that, is whenever you're an in-house lawyer, you're more than just a solicitor. My goodness. Um, I have been a COSAC. I have been a, um, a policy writer for HR. Um, I've been writing governance, uh, corporate governance documents. I have been um, the, the risk owner for anti-bribery and competition law. I have been responsible for making sure that those uh, policies have been embedded properly in the organization. Um, I have been um, a conflict resolution um, manager for conflicts between different teams. And the hats that you wear are very different and inconsistent compared to a private practice lawyer, where you know you're going in there and you're a lawyer, and, and in-house you, you can and you say, what hat do I have to wear today? And for me, I enjoyed that because it was different. There was different challenges every day. Both jobs come with their different challenges, but those kind of challenges I quite enjoyed. And then I would say the one of the big one of the one of the other big key differences, which is probably obvious to everyone, is that your client is also your employer. And in house, we don't talk about clients; we talk about stakeholders. And it just means that the way that you engage with your client is very different. And as much as you want to be able to hide whenever you can see someone coming down the hall, <laughs> um, you can't. Um, in private practice, you're at an arm's length and you do get that space and you get that freedom of thought a little bit more. We're in house, it's not, it's just right on top of you and it can feel, feel very consuming and overwhelming if you're not used to that. So that I would say that if you are thinking of moving that you would need to climatize towards that. I would say those are, those are the big differences. Yeah, yeah. And I know you're saying like, oh, some of these might be obvious. And yeah, OK, when you think about it, yeah, I know that my client would be sitting next door or, or you know, um, in, an, in another office. But then you think of the impact of that. And then what does it mean that me as an in-house lawyer, you know, what does that how does that change my job? You know, it's, it's the extra mm -hmm. steps that maybe aren't so obvious or you haven't haven't thought about. Um, so you've told us what an in-house role can uh, encompass which sounds you know huge and, oh. and I know for some people would be so exciting and then for some people it would be like terrifying so it's really important sure. to think about that but um what are the top three skills and key attitudes you need to make it as an in-house lawyer well if you've actually really heard what I was saying in the answer to the last question it's all about the biggest skill is all about people mm and being able to be really self-aware of your impact on other people and self-aware more so about what triggers you and triggers your anxiousness or your stresses or knowing and being able to identify that you feel a little bit overwhelmed so you can um, take those steps that you need to in order to um, manage that. Now, the first thing I do with every single client that comes into the in-house lawyers leadership program is we do an assessment of where they are in terms of their self-awareness and we do that through disc profiling and then we go into that a little bit deeper and we look at you know are they aware of you know how they're perceived by other people that have got different preferences for example and um, we kind of delve into that to give them a little bit more of an understanding uh, with regards to how they could uh, adopt the style to a um, 
go into somebody else's world and understand where they're coming from. And that really, really helps to enhance your relationship, which will enhance your impact. And you will actually then start really hearing what the other person is saying in terms of the stresses that they have within their jobs. So as much as that, that might sound a little bit like a soft skill, it is the biggest skill you need to have. And those can be all wrapped up into self-awareness, emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence includes emotion management, which is your own emotion management, environment management, understanding the room and reading other people's needs. And it's only when you have things like that in place that we can start talking about being able to show up with authenticity, with empathy. You will be able to um, set boundaries because when you know what your values are and what you're prepared to allow other people to step on, um, can you say no in a really effective and really kind way so that the other person understands. Now I'm going to give you a live example of that. I wasn't very self-aware as a junior lawyer and I did have coaching and in actual fact um, I worked in Seven Trent and they provided coaching for every single person in the team and it really opened my eyes because I understood something that I never understood before and I thought why didn't somebody just tell me that but people don't and when I when I kind of was a little bit more aware and my impact on other people, I actually softened my approach and I noticed a massive change in how people were responding towards me. And people were actually coming up to me and saying, you've changed, what's happened? I was like, I just realized that I probably wasn't as aware of my impact. So that was part of the reason why I moved 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 to coaching as well. And the second one, I would say, and this is where in-house lawyers really struggle um, because we're all trained as lawyers and we're not trained to do this. Um, some people are naturally quite good at it and some aren't because they're quite, um, they're not quite showcasing. So what I mean is you need to have the ability to showcase your impact in a very um, kind and soft way. So you're not, so you're not kind of doing it in a way that makes you come across as somebody who's a little bit in a, in unapproachable. Um, and what I mean by showcasing your value is being able to connect what you do as an individual to the strategy and the purpose of the organisation and to record that in a way that the organisation understands it so they can see that you as an individual are adding value and then the whole team is adding value and whenever you're able to do that you're able to showcase that to your boss and then you're giving your boss the ammunition to have a conversation with the executives within the organization in order to position the legal team in the right place to create that healthy tension that has to happen between the legal team and the commercial team or the procurement team or the IT team so that the risk in the business is fully understood and it's been mitigated properly. And the third one is knowing how to have a little bit of fun because our sector, private practice, in-house, any kind of lawyer, we're all quite serious. And our jobs, we do have highly pressured jobs, which comes along with its own stress. And then we've got other stresses that uh, go on outside that. And because we're humans, we, we, they, they will seep into our work. And so I would say, remember just to enjoy it and have fun and have fun with your clients. In-house is a really, attractive workplace for someone who wants to expand their knowledge sideways and to become more of a business person and to really enhance their position even within the legal industry to be held out as a lead within their area if you wanted to retain that sector um, specialist area.
So good. Yeah, yeah. I, I knew this talk would be like that, where you're giving advice about how to succeed in-house, but like those steps, you know, okay, maybe they're more important in-house, but they're certainly important in private practice as well, in my opinion knowing yourself and being aware of what the business wants from you and okay you've you've billables so that's kind of an easy measure but there's lots more and you know really thinking about that how am I how am I helping the the purpose yeah um and I I am aware that some of uh, some private practice firms especially I worked in Irish Sheds um they're moving forward in measuring um performance in different ways Mm. And as we, we worked with, with um, I worked with Eversheds both as a, um, as an employee and as a client. Mm-hmm. And I have seen the massive changes that that's made both with, for their employees and for their clients. Yeah, yeah, really important. Um, we're able to open up for questions now. We have five minutes left. So if people want to put their questions in the chat, don't, you, you've, you've seen how much of an expert Donna is, so don't miss out on this opportunity to get your questions in. Um, but I, yeah, I just noticed that point, you, you know, you were talking about earlier um, of the different kind of people. We, we spoke a bit before about um, the different people in an organization and, and that kind of tension, you know, those people, that, you know, who kind of a pain in the arse, but they're really important. Could you speak a bit about that? <laughs> well, yes. Um, are you sorry, just to clarify, uh, are you, can you just clarify the question? Sorry. You, you you spoke to me before about like, I think it's like four different types of people that the organization. Oh, has. yes. I beg your pardon. Yes. So we all we all um, have got a preferred way to communicate in the workplace. And I uh, basically I'm a disk a profiler and disk is um, a tool that you can um, you can you can work out what your workplace profile is and there's four there's dominant um influencer then you've got someone who's conscientious and then you've got someone who's quite steady and each one of those um have their own limitations and they have their own um assets and to know which one you fall into is quite key whenever you are looking at communicating with another person where you might for example have said I don't really understand that person or what they're coming from I just don't get it and I know they don't get me when you do your desk profiling you will get it I will drop that's what happened to me I done my desk profile and I understood why really detailed um, quiet people got really annoyed with me because I'm quite high li- I'm quite lively and they're I know I can distract and I had to learn to calm that down Mm-hmm. I think that's really important you know like that kind of thing of oh it's just annoying I don't get on with this person or that person doesn't get me but you know you need you to be aware of how you're perceived. What are you doing to go into their world? Yeah. It's all about stepping into their world first because and it's all about expectations and we're, we're, we're what we think we're owed yeah. within the place our workplace. We have a great question here in the chat. Um, how much experience would you say you'd need in private practice before moving in-house? You don't need any private practice experience to move in house. There you go. Wow. I don't think people are expecting that answer. That's great. You you can move. So I would say I moved after four years. And the reason why I moved after four years is because I was acutely aware that um, I wanted to actually, I went on secondment and ended up staying. That's what happened. And I wanted to expand my uh, development sideways and that's why I that's why I moved but essentially you can move at any time there is no rule there is no place outside saying you can't move in house because you're only six months qualified in actual fact I know someone who's never worked in private practice so crack on get that application in (laughs) And another really good question here, and a thanks to you, but um, just to get the question in, uh, she's the only solicitor in an organization of 1300 people. So she's looking for tips on how to grow and develop a legal team. We need to have a separate call. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like, I think you've done that. You told me you you de- you hired. Yes, so you know. Emma, Emma, I've just put my um, LinkedIn um, details in the chat. Why don't you send me a message on uh, LinkedIn and I can give you a complimentary coaching session. 
Ah, that's lovely. That's great. Look at you. Um, and I may, probably the final question here, just in terms of time, um, is it possible to get an in-house role after being out of work for a while? Yeah. yeah. Don't see those questions. You're putting limitations on yourself. Hmm. The question is, why wouldn't all you have to do is justify your time. And I'm sure you've got a reason why you've been off work. Yeah. And the worst reason is, I just needed a break. I, I took time out. I said I needed a break. Yeah. I think uh, your your confidence, you know, I can see in a coaching session how that would transfer to the, the person, you know, just being like, why are you putting yourself down? Why don't you think you can do it? You know, and it's just, you come it's just unnecessary. Hmm. Yeah. Now, I have to say, I sometimes I have to tell myself that. <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> um, well, we we uh, have have come up against our lot of time there. Unfortunately, um, there's there's other questions in the chat there. So I I think Donna, you'd be happy to talk to anybody um, for a complimentary chat um, o- offline. Yeah, um, just quickly, Cosmina, um, I'm not sure what the rules are in Ireland. I just know in a the um, England and Wales that as long as you're not doing what they call reserved work and you don't need a practicing certificate to work in house. Go. Another quick answer with a good strong message. Brilliant. Um, Okay well we'll have to leave it there unfortunately. Um, As I said Donna is uh, on LinkedIn. Her newsletter is there. It's going to be coming out in the e-zine. Her um, ILLP in-house lawyer practitioner program um, is available. You can find out more about that on her LinkedIn and uh, yeah please do get in touch with Donna. I'm sure she'll be happy to talk to you. Thanks everyone for joining today and we'll see you at the next. Thank you everybody. Good luck in your careers. (laughs) Thanks.